Good evening. I'm Alexander Rose. I'm the director at the Long Now Foundation. Uh, as uh, many of you know, we have been uh, working towards uh, funding our salon project. And uh, just this last week, uh, after a flurry's, flurry of great uh, donations, we passed our halfway point, which means we're going to start construction next month. So thank you all. And uh, the other big news with that is that Brian Eno agreed to do all the ambient sound for the whole space, as well as a video installation in the back room uh, that will be sound and video specific for the space. So we're super excited to have that. Um, we're still uh, $200,000 away from finishing our, uh, our, our fundraising, but um, we hope to be there by the time we open, which will be about six months, so early 2014. Um, before these talks, we, do, we, we try and do a long short, a short film that exemplifies long-term thinking. And uh, this week's is one, or this month's is one, that uh, comes to us from a Long Now member who uh, did a project with the Exploratorium and I believe also uh, was supported by the Awesome Foundation, uh, a lot of kind of cross paths. And, and, uh, and Ken, are you here? There you are, right there. Thank you very much for this video. I, you offered it to us a long time, but we've been trying to find the right path for it, and uh, Craig Childs seemed like the, the perfect one for it. Um, when we roll it, we're also going to show you uh, a, a new piece of video that uh, was done by an animator, uh, James Anderson. Uh, it was organized by, uh, by Chris Baldwin, our videographer, and um, the sound for it was done by Brian Eno for us. It's the 10 seconds of Long Now Identifier that's going to roll before uh, all of our talks online, but tonight we're going to show it just before the, the long short. So enjoy.
I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. It's pretty interesting to hold a whole year in your mind for a few minutes like that. What would it be like to experience a whole eon of the events that occur in eons on the planet? Um, I was talking with our speaker tonight just a few minutes ago, and we were talking about once you get off out into a boondock, even a pretty close boondock, or even just look straight overhead from the Exploratorium, uh, you get out of the short now pretty fast and engage a, a different frame of time. The planet is not normal right now. And we usually take blame for that. And the Anthropocene, we're screwing up the climate, we're doing this and that. But it wasn't normal before we started screwing it up. Uh, we're in an interglacial. Normal in the last few eons has been ice. And uh, normal at other times has been seriously different uh, from the current. I think this is going to, I just realized as we start exploring other planets or knowing more about other planets from remote sensing, uh, we're not going to find them in a state of welcome <laughs> uh, to humans. Uh, we might put them into a state of welcome for humans if we're powerful enough to get there. But planets uh, do lots of strange things. And What's wonderful about this one is that it doesn't do the same thing uh, everywhere. And so we have a speaker who is intrepid enough to go to the places where it is extremely out of this period of time. And uh, so he's a lot more than just looking up from the sky at the Exploratorium. He's looking into how a really dynamic planet behaves <laughs> Uh, way out of human control, or even, in most cases, perception. Uh, I recommend his book, which is available in the lobby, Apocalyptic Planet. Um, I first came across him through an earlier book called House of Rain, where the way he uh, inspected how the civilizations of the Southwest must have come and gone with climate and other events was uh, he just went out and walked, hiked. Uh, spent serious time in the bush, um, experiencing what they must have experienced as they went from canyons to mountains to desert to this place and another. It's a pretty interesting way to recreate history. In this case, he's recreating an even longer history than that. Craig Childs. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate it. Hi there. I'm just down from Alaska. Been out traveling, seeing things, looking at the planet, looking at uh, looking at ice up up in the mountains that are just mouthfuls of glaciers coming down into uh, out of the Kenai Peninsula and down into over into Prince William Sound, places where where ice is floating out in the water. Right now, it's it's. It's melting. It's heading into high summer. And up there, the sun's not really setting. It's just doing that kind of that tilted hula hoop that it does in Alaska during the summer. It changes your, your perception of time. I, I saw the stars for the first time uh, two nights ago. I haven't seen them for, for a while before then. This, this planet we live on, this earth, is a storyteller. Everywhere you go out there, it is, it is telling a story in, in the way that wind moves across rock, the way stars move through the sky and the moonlight comes on. You go out there and you move in it and you can feel time around you. You can feel the, the forces that affect this planet, forces that collide and forces that, that intertwine and create. You, you really get a sense of of how time unfolds when you're out there, when you're in it, when it's live and it's real and it's under your feet and the, the sand is in your teeth and, and you're drinking the water out of the cups, out of the, the, the holes in the rock where the rain gathers. The earth is a storyteller. Everywhere you go out there, 
It tells a story. I, I stopped in, in Yosemite National Park for a couple days on, on my way through to here, and, and um, I realized out there how clearly you see it. When you, when you look at this, this landscape, this is, uh, this is this morning, uh, um, sunrise hitting, hitting Half Dome, and, uh, and, and you look at this and, and you see that things are, are on a completely different scale than, than they should be, that, that you look at the, the creeks in Yosemite, and there are these little creeks flowing through these big, big drainages where, where the, the scale is off, and you realize that something big happened here. Go back to the, the end of the Pleistocene, go back uh, 12,000... 15,000 years ago as, as the ice was falling apart and melting and, and rivers were just roaring down out of these glaciers. You walk in this place and you can see what happened before. You can see the other times around you and, and you get a sense of how time moves, that, that it, it comes in these small increments of, of the, the shadows moving over the rock and in these large increments of, of being able to see where the glaciers just poured and flowed through these valleys and filled up these valleys until the mountains, just their, their summits were sticking up above the ice. The first thing I did when I got there is I put my back against some, some of the ice-polished granite and I just looked up at the sky and watched the clouds move and just marveled at the, at the, the fact that this, this big old granitic batholith was was shoved up into the sky in a place where the glaciers would climb all over it and sculpt it. It's, it's like putting a, a big chunk of marble on a, on a sculptor's front doorstep and saying, have at it. And that's what happened to Yosemite. The ice went and had at it. And you're thinking in those time scales at the same time that you're, you're watching the shadows move across the rock. You're watching the day progress, and you're feeling underneath your feet that slick polish of granite where ice has been moving. Everywhere you go out there, it tells a story. While I was there on my back, I, I realized that, that uh, I, I hadn't put the pieces together, that I had just been in, in Alaska um, uh, traveling on an ice field that has swallowed a bunch of mountains, and, and I had been uh, skiing with, with uh, sleds and ropes across this, this ice field, and, and now I was at the bottom, on my back, looking up through what would have been a thousand feet of ice, so I could see myself skiing way up there, way over my head. This is, this is what it looks like here, and this is what it looks like there. This is, a, uh, this is the Harding Ice Field, which is about a thousand square miles of, of ice sitting up on, on top of the Kenai Peninsula with, with glaciers pouring down. And, and, uh, and it is just, it is an elemental landscape, which is what I'm really looking for. I, I go out in, into the world looking for these places that are, that are reduced, that are primary, that come down to white, ice, snow, rock, these noon attacks, these, these summits of, of mountains sticking up through the ice. You know, I, I was looking at this, this picture right here and then uh, looking yesterday at, at, uh, at this in Yosemite and, and realizing, oh, they, these are the same things, just that uh, it's, it's over here. It's already happened, and it's not over up there where you're skiing across ice surfaces that are, that are about a, a thousand feet deep, and you're just you're feeling the weight of that ice underneath you, setting your camps up on the surface of the Harding Ice Field, and moving on, carrying your gear, listening to the, the slide of your, your skis and the sled on snow, moving across this elemental ter terrain that just, that just fills your senses, the crevasses that are si the size of buildings, that drop down into darkness. You want to go around those. <laughs> Don't go through them. I've heard some people say you feel small in the wilderness when you go out to places like this. But I actually believe it's more that you lose your sense of scale when you go out there because there, we were just tiny dots the whole time. But were we small or could you just not tell the size of things? 
I love those landscapes that just obliterate your sense of scale, where you don't know if you're small or if you're large. You can't tell because it is just the world. Everything is one-to-one scale. It is all equal when you're out there. And these nunataks, that's the word for the, the, the mountains that are completely surrounded by ice, they're, these, they're magical to see. And, and they're, they're, just, they're just poking through, and you know that the, the rest of the mountain is down beneath, and the nunatak is just the last part that the, the glaciers haven't been able to digest. And as opposed to Yosemite, where you have to climb way up to get on top of the mountains, here you just ski up to the summits. It's much easier except for the crevasses, but remember, go around and, and just trust that your snow bridge will sustain your weight underneath you. You go up onto these nunataks and you climb up on top and you look around and you are surrounded by the ice field and by the other mountains sticking up. And your sense of time and process is very different from the everyday, from moving, from waking up in the morning and getting your coffee and all the, the pieces and parts of our lives. I mean, we spend so much time in these, in these boxes, and, and I spend so much time on my computer underneath a roof that's hiding the dome of the sky. All you have to do is walk outside. I mean, just opening the door and leaving this building at the end of the day, you will walk out there and you will taste the wind. You will see the the fog moving through. You will see this world that is constantly changing. I I when I wrote Apocalyptic Planet, I was I was interested in seeing landscapes that that showed the Earth in its most elemental forms, uh, and and uh, you know they're in a sense they're endings. Um, um, they're you know I'm, I'm looking at. at desertification, sea level rise, uh, loss of glaciers or, or encroachment of glacial periods, uh, I'm looking out to asteroid impacts, uh, volcanism, uh, mass extinctions. I'm looking for landscapes around the world that tell this story where you go into it and you can see that's that one story in front of you. So since we're on the topic of ice, I want to take you to a place where I'm looking at the world as, as, it, as it is in, in a glacial period, uh, out to, uh, um, to the Greenland ice sheet. I flew in in uh, 2010 to a, a small camp, uh, a seven-person camp, um, out on the, on the west side of the, the Greenland ice sheet, and, and uh, my object here was to was to see a place just locked in ice, you know, no mountains sticking out, nothing alive, just, just ice, where when you land, this is in May, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's 20 below. It's, it's, it's a cold and windy and, and uh, nasty place, which I just, I love those places. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, very quickly you forget everything else about the world. The whole earth becomes locked in ice. The, the plane lands, you unload a thousand pounds of gear underneath the wing, and the, the wind is just skating by and rapidly puts these, these shark fins of snowdrifts behind your gear. And, and, uh, and the, the plane takes off, and there's, there's nothing more magical than being dropped in a place like this and watching the plane leave. <laughs> there, were, there were two of us who were dropped off. The, the, camp, uh, the camp had been closed all winter, and, and so we were there to open it up. And, um, and what added to this, this sense of wonder as the plane is leaving is that the other guy with me, who is a, a chaos researcher, Jose Real from uh, North Carolina University, he, he had been here this was his sixth season, and, and as he's marching to the camp, he's, he's cursing, going, oh, my God, what happened? What happened to this place? So I'm watching the plane go, and I'm looking over and saying, what do you mean? What's going on? And, and, um, and he's, he, he was saying, a, a third of camp is gone. It's just gone. And, and I'm looking around thinking, well, there's supposed to be a bunch of snow machines here, and they're gone, too. And... And, and as I look closer, I can see that the front door is open on the tent, and, and the snow has just drifted in and filled it up, and, and we're, the ice that, we're on about 5,000 feet of ice right here, and, and I'm shouting back to him, going, where, where are the snowmobiles? And he's saying, I don't know, they're down there somewhere, and I'm looking down, going, 
Well, this is 5,000 feet of down there. Where, where exactly down there are you talking about? So we, uh, we started looking around and f found that the camp had just been ravaged by storms, that the weather stations were down, the solar panels had catapulted off, and, and the place was just a mess. And so we started digging our way into it. Um, Jose was the first one to slide in through the door into the kitchen tent here. <laughs> and, and then I was working on the, uh, the research tent next to it, clearing it out. And when I, when I finally got the, the door open and inside, this is what I saw, this, this, this frozen inferno where you, you walk back into it and, and stalactites of, of, of ice crystals are hanging off the ceiling and you can just brush your, your hand through them and they just they sprinkle to the ground. This is, this is the desk of, of Conrad Steffen, who is... Um, who is one of the lead cryosphere authors for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which I just think is perfect that his, his desk is just absolutely buried. <laughs> and then digging it out is, this isn't, this isn't like the snow we know around here. This is this, this, it's like digging through wallboard where you have to break it off in chunks and then carry these chunks outside. It is, it is just compacted back in here. And so I, I'm excavating his desk and finding all the, the pieces of electronics he left at the end of the last season and, and some of his notes and, um, and this. <laughs> Which I think, I think when you're working as a scientist in climate change, uh, you need that. <laughs> because... <laughs> I mean, you, you spend time with climate researchers, and, and the story starts looking pretty dire. So, so uh, you know, we nice. uncorked it. Go ahead and take a swig. Now, Jose is a, is a chaos researcher uh, in, in climate change. Perfect person to be up there. He'd uh, be up there with because... Uh, He's, he's always looking for, he, he was always telling me, you know, we, we have predictions and models, but what happens is always what you don't expect. And, and I talked to him about uh, ice ages, you know, and he, he said, yeah, we could be looking at another ice age coming up soon. Nobody else says that, but the chaos person does. You pull your head out of the tent and you look around and this is what you see. Just this, this emptiness surrounding you where it's, it's, it's just one scale. There is no large, no small. It feels as if there is almost no time. You are just here now. And it, it looks flat, but it's actually, it's undulating very slowly. And, and camp is moving because the whole ice sheet is moving. I think camp is moving at about a foot per day. And when it was originally built in 19, I think in 93 or, or in the early 90s, it was up on top of one of these crests. And now it's down in the trough. And so this, the camp is just surfing its way along the ice sheet. And the ice is, is, is moving on down to the co coast where, it, where it, it dumps. And uh, this dumps out in the Jakobshavn Glacier, which is uh, the largest producer of icebergs in, in the world, or at least in the norm northern hemisphere. And uh, the same year I was out, this, uh, this footage was taken at the, at the, the end of the Jakobshavn Glacier of a... Uh, an iceberg a few hundred feet tall breaking off and then collapsing. So this is where camp is heading. Eventually, it will, it will drop into this and, um, and uh, well, maybe that's where we're all heading eventually. <laughs> and you go down to the, the, the Jakobshavn Glacier and you watch the, these icebergs coming off. It, it's just like these these floating white cities out there just constantly being produced and moving out in front of you. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, that there's a 40-foot long boat right over there. And I, I spent uh, 13 hours one day just sitting here in this one spot watching the icebergs come and go. And, and, and you look out in the distance and see these, these just enormous ones floating out there. And, and you just realize the... The, the scale of the forces around you, that, that, that this planet is moving, ice is flowing down and dumping into the sea, and you stay there until midnight watching the ice moving around you. 
Now, up on the ice sheet itself, you don't see any of this movement other than, you know, you're moving a foot a day, but you can't see it. The only movement out there is the wind, which is constant, even, even when it's not blowing. This is a moment where the wind isn't blowing. Um, you know, it's, it's just skating across the surface. Everything is being continually sculpted around you. And I'm out there just, just looking back at the Earth's history, just thinking, how we are still right now technically within an ice age. We are in a, a period in Earth's history where there is still a lot of ice on the planet that swings in and out of glacial and interglacial periods, but we're in an ice age. And many of the, the climate change researchers that I, that I worked with, um, that, I, that I interviewed and, and spent time with for this book, we're talking about how we are, we are probably leaving this period of ice ages. We're entering a new period in Earth's history and, and you know, I, that terrifies me because I, I, I like where we are right now. I think the, the Holocene is, uh, is, save the Holocene. It's, it's, it's the great time on earth, at least for us, for, for our kind and the species around us. It's, it's a marvelous time because, you know, look back. There, there have been periods long, long ago where, where um, you know, billions of years ago where the earth was encased in ice, where the where equatorial seas were bobbing with slush and you had a, a white planet. You know, not a, not a friendly place, not, not like this place we are now. And that's what I wanted to get a look at here. I wanted to, wanted to just see what is ice about? What, what is it about to live in, in, in a time where, where there's nothing but white all around you? In the coming days, different members of the, the crew arrived and, and we... Um, we slowly dug out the the, uh, the ski dews that had been that had collapsed into the, the snow, while the wind is blowing around us, and it took us days to get these things out. And at night, you're in your 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 tent, and the the wind is building snow up around you, and the tent is getting smaller and smaller all night long. It's pushing on the back of your head until you're going fetal because the walls are closing in. And, and you've got a, a piece of automotive hosing sticking, hose sticking out of the, the top of the tent just in case you get totally sealed off. You can still breathe out of this thing. And all night long, you're feeling the weight of the snow building up on you. That's, that, I, I guess I go out looking for this, for what is what is visceral about these stories? I, I look at the, the science, I, I talk to the researchers, but then I, I, I walk out there into it to feel what it's like. It's windy out there. And for me, it is just so beautiful because it's reduced. All the pieces and parts that we're used to are, are stripped away. I think I'll stay inside. <laughs> and you go out in the morning and you look at these shapes that the wind has sculpted around you, these, these beautiful teardrops and starships of, of snow. It's, it's a, you, you can see the processes of the planet on, on so many scales when you're, when you're in places where it's just reduced, where, where it, is, it is ice, it is sky, it is wind. It is wind that is carving these, these, these forms across the surface of the ice sheet. And, and I want to be there when it's happening. That's why I, I'm, I'm excited to be on this planet right now. You know, as, as we're talking about uh, going from, from the Holocene to the Anthropocene, as we're talking about major changes, I, you know, there's something about being there when it's happening. I, I, I went to uh, the, uh, the research station in May because I wanted to see the, the transition from winter into summer, which is like a six-day transition. It, it, the, the temperature is going up by half a, half a degree per day. I wanted to be there at that moment where it happened, where, where you, could, you could sit on the south-facing uh, side of the, the tent and it, it was warm, where the, the plexiglass window on the, on the kitchen tent had been, had been frozen solid, just this block of ice, and then it melted. And the, the reason camp was, was originally 
put in this spot was uh, this is this is where the snow never melts. This is where the the glacier, uh, the the ice sheet is continuing to grow, and so they're they're studying the the movement of 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 the ice at this at this spot. So you're, you know, this is this is continually winter here. Even in the summer, it stays frozen. But while I was there, it warmed up. It warmed up enough that you could go outside and you could take the first showers and, and ice turned from this into this. It started to melt. And like I said, this is 2010. Uh, a couple months later, this is an aerial view of the camp. You can see that the melt has come inland and just gone past the camp. So a, a place that has remained frozen year-round is no longer frozen. It is melted out. There's, there's the camp there. And for the first time since the early 90s, this camp completely fell apart. And you see the change happening. And yeah, we live on a planet that is constantly changing. I mean, we, we live on this, this planet of, of cycles, of rhythms, of seasons, seasons that happen in, throughout a year, seasons that happen over centuries, over thousands of years, swings up and down, but then you have episodes, you have moments of sudden change. And that's where the, the, uh, Jose, the chaos researcher, kept talking about these jumps, he would say, yeah, the, the earth is, is going into one of these jumps, and you don't know what is going to be on the other side of those jumps. We're, we're talking as if the ice age ha has ended and we're, we're leaving the ice, but you don't know when it jumps, it could go anywhere. We could, we could drop back into a glacial period. We're experiencing a jump. The earth is always jumping. This is not a stable place to live. We look at the mountains and the, and the rivers, and, and we think... These, this is the way it's always been. I mean, the, it, it seems that way. We want it to be that way. I want it to be that way. I don't want the Holocene to end. I want it to be like this forever. It doesn't happen. If you want to see melt, the place to go is, uh, is South America, is to the... Uh, um, is, is to the uh, mid-latitude glaciers. I traveled uh, a couple years ago down to northern Patagonia and, uh, uh, in, in Chile on a, on a trek with, with a, a film crew. We went out uh, for a month crossing these, these glaciers coming down off the northern, northern Patagonian ice field. And this, these are the largest non-polar ice masses in the world. Um, I think it's 8,000 square miles of ice sitting on top of the, uh, the Andes. Uh, this, this is right at the edge of the ice field where, where it's, just, it's just pouring around these summits, down into these glaciers, into the valleys below. And, and we were trekking up along the bases of these, of these glaciers. And this is a place where a, a glacier um, in the 70s came over this pass and down into the next valley where I had been talking to Gal who, who said, oh yeah, we used to pasture up here, but then there was a big wall of ice. And you could see where the wall of ice had been because there are no trees there. And, and they told me how fast it retreated up and over this pass, and it had been on top of this pass just a few years before we got there. So this place is just freshly scoured from a glacier retreating back to the, the mother glacier back there. It, it retreated so recently that the ground is still dewatering. Creeks are still coming out of these, these high passes uh, where the ice had been. And you're walking through this place that, that is just, it's booming because these, the, there are big seracs, big, big faces of of ice falling off. Some of them are four or five stories tall, breaking free from up in the mountains or down along the glacier, glacial front. And just all night long, you're hearing these booms. You're in your tent, and, and, and some of them are loud. There, you, you feel them through your back, just this boom, and you just wake up going, ha, ah, where? Ah, ah, Patagonia, okay, Patagonia, uh, Serac, Serac, ice, okay. Uh. It's such a loud place, 
and it feels like you're within the geologic gears of the earth and they're grinding against each other. They're, they're turning and, 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 and there's nothing to give scale out there. There's nothing, there are no trees. Everything's been, been just erased from, from the land because the mountain has just been clawed out. And you look over at these pieces of ice and, and you think you could reach over and just pick them up and put them in your mouth. And so you walk over to them and you find that they're much larger than you had <laughs> anticipated. But still, you, you, you take off a piece and you, you put it into your mouth and it turns to water and you drink it. And you're thinking, this has been ice for a thousand years or maybe 5,000 years. And now it's turning to water. I want to be there at that moment that it changes. I want to know what that change is like. Some of these, these pieces of the former glacier, are just, they're just lying around like mansions, big pieces of ice where you can, you can go into them and, and you just run your hand across their, their surface. It's, it's like wet marble, cold, wet marble. And, you know, we all relate to it differently. This is uh, uh, a friend who is a, a rock climber uh, named Timmy O'Neill, kind of a, a crazy guy. Um, this is his relationship with these pieces of ice. We have the world's largest gin and tonic. What we need is a really big tumbler, a giant lime, and a shitload of gin. <laughs> I mean, you got to find a way of relating to it, right? I, I found while writing Apocalyptic Planet, I did not want to just be writing about how it's all coming to an end. Like, yes, the world is ending. It's always ending. The end is not a moment. The end is not, uh, there's a flash and it's all over. Suddenly everything's covered with ice or suddenly it's all melted and it's all desert now or everything is extinct all at once. The end is, is a process. It's something that, that it's, it's change. It, 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 I don't see it as, as necessarily runaway planet toward one singular end. It, it, is, it is something that is, that is constantly changing and dynamic. You get up on top of this, this, these glaciers and, and they are loud with running water. It, it, you're hearing these rivers forming underneath you. Just the ice is rumbling. It, it sounds like a, a ship engine below deck where, where water is, is coursing down through these moulins into the interior of, of the glacier. And you look down these holes and, and you're looking down into this, this blue within blue. It's, it's, it's this, this just beautiful color that's so rich. It, it feels perilous just, just to look inside of it. And you, you find some crack, some crevasse, and you crawl down into it and you follow the water where it's sculpted its way inside the glacier. And you know, you, you think that you'd feel claustrophobic in here, but it feels like you're, you're being held in the blue palm of the earth. And you just wedge by your shoulders and try to lean out as far as you can to see around the corner where the water is flowing down inside the glacier. This is the head of the, the Rio Baker, the, the largest river in Chile, and this is where it begins. We actually, on this trek, we, 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 we started there, and as soon as the river was large enough, um, which uh, is not far down from here, we, we moved to kayaks and rafts and ran it all the way out to the sea just to, to complete the whole cycle and then back up to the glacier. We were making a circle out of ourselves. The ice has been melting, and it forms these lakes that are backed up behind ice dams, and the lakes have been blowing out, creating what are called gloffs, glacial lake outburst floods, and... Uh, and, and there are these enormous floods that have been coming down. This, this is the, uh, the Colonia Glacier in, in, uh, in, in Patagonia. And, and this, this hadn't seen very many gloffs in, in recorded history. And then, uh, and then three years ago, lakes started building up on the surface and then exploding out the downstream end. And these, these enormous floods have been coming out. This is, this is the... Uh, the exit wound of, of one of these floods. Uh, the, the terminus of the glacier is, is probably about 100 feet tall, just to give you a sense of scale. That, that right there is a, is a big chunk of ice that's covered with sand, and here it is when we're next to it. And these things are just, 
are, are exploding out of the end of the glacier in, the, in these floods. And, and the floods are large enough that they, they travel 40 miles downstream. They hit the Rio Baker, which is, which is an enormous river, you know, the, the largest in Chile. And the, the floods actually turn the river around, and the river flows upstream for 20 miles for the next few days. So it's flooding all these upstream towns. So these are, these are significant events, and they're, they're happening right now once a month. So these, these floods have been building up, these large lakes building up, exploding out the other side. We, we paddled this, this ducky out to, to get a look at the, the terminus of the glacier where it's just junk. It's just floating pieces of ice where you, you put on your crampons and you try to walk across this stuff, but you're walking on rolling logs of ice. And uh, I do not advise doing this. But when you're out there, you're hearing the glacier cracking. You're hearing the terminus. And, and, and we're thinking, okay, well, a flood could come. But, you know, we got, we got like a, a three-hour window here to get in and have a look at it and get out. And there's not going to be a flood within those three hours. And I remember at one point there was just this sound that sounded like a, a, a metal eye beam snapping in half in the terminus of the glacier. It was just this ping, and we all just stopped. And we're just staring at it, just waiting. You know, is this thing going to open up and out comes the flood? And, and just, you know, that moment of looking at each other going, no, no, everything's fine. Just keep running around like wild monkeys out on the ice. And it gradually builds in intensity, growing in ferocity until it's this massive force like Vishnu, like this juggernaut destroying everything in its path. Do you want to be a chicken, a goat, a horse, a pig, or a human? In its way? No, you don't. You want to run really fast. The cloth's coming! Look out! So here's a 200 foot, foot deep meltwater lake, and you can see it just drain out right there. And, and uh, this is, uh, I believe this is a, a, an image per day. So, um, so this is uh, across the, the length of a summer. This is just one lake. And, and once it blows out, the ice seals back up and the meltwater gathers behind it. And, and like I said, that's, that's, that's about 200 feet deep. And then boom, it goes out. So it goes out rapidly. And then it, it blasts out downstream. And, and you go down into the, the valleys below and you just see, um, well, this is, this is where, this isn't the flood, but this is, this is where it, enter, it would enter the, the river. This is the Rio, Rio Baker. Um, you go down into these valleys, and it, and it just, it's just devastation. What this, this flood hit this valley in, I think, 1986, and it was, it was a, a forested valley with a fairly narrow glacial plain in the middle with a river come, running across it, and this flood just took out everything in the valley floor. And I talked to the gauchos who, who saw it, who got their livestock or some of their livestock out, and, and they, just, they were just just overwhelmed by the sight of this water moving down, the boulders that are, that are moving around in this, uh, you know, just huge rocks carried down in these floods. You're up in this, and you realize things move on this planet. Things are not still. Everything is turning, and, and you try to be there when it's happening. You get up there, and you look at a valley that has been scoured out. This is the, down below the Colonia Glacier, where the forests used to run almost from wall to wall with a, with a river down the middle, and it's just cleared out. I look for that. I look for those elemental places. I look for where the earth tells a story, where it makes you realize that you are on a planet. I think it, it's, it's so easy to go through our lives and not realize what we're on top of. <laughs> uh, it, I forget all the time until I walk out and look up, and you realize that you're on a ball in space surrounded by others, and you look at the others, you look at Mars, and you go, God, what happened there? <laughs> What went wrong? <laughs> and you look the other way. This is, this is an image of Venus without the clouds. And it's just like, ah, another corpse over there. Uh, and we're, we're right in the middle just going, yeah, what's, what's happening around us? We live out in this. We are floating out there, spinning. 
we live around a star. And I, I, I think about what, you know, how thin the layers are. You, you go to a place like the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, and you see how thin the layers are. You are out there in a desert that is the driest non-polar desert in the world, and the sun just feels naked on top of you. I, 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 I traveled out there uh, with, with a friend of mine um, uh, a couple years ago, uh, and, and this is for a, the, the book that I wrote, Apocalyptic Planet. We were, we were trekking across the Atacama where... where in the morning, you, you would start walking toward your destination, but the, the sun would come up and start pushing you the other way because you couldn't walk into the light of the sun. You're, you're uh, here, we're at about 8,000 feet in elevation, and it's just, it's just dry and clear, and the sun is burning through you, and you have to walk away from it. And, and so the, it's, it's like trying to sail through, through a wind, you're, you're, you're ha- but the sun is the wind. You keep it at your back, and as it rises and moves, your, your course changes. So all day long, you're keeping the sun behind you. There's nothing out there to shade you. It is just this open, dry desert, places where rain has not fallen for centuries, a desert that has existed there for 150 million years. To me, one of the most beautiful places I have seen, where you find, you find a bush, and this is, uh, this is alive because there are 19,000-foot volcanoes on the horizon where snow collects sometimes, and that snow melts, runs downstream, goes underneath these salars, the, these big salt pans that are in the basins between the mountains, and, and so uh, saline plants can grow down there. We spent like two hours at this bush because it was the only thing, and you just, you just crawl into it, and it's, it's, like, it's something else that is alive like you, and, and it's, it's almost like you're the same species, because you can go, hi, good, you're, you're out here, we're out here too, it's good to see you, <laughs> because otherwise you're walking across salt, nothing but salt, where the ridges, uh, there are 2,000 foot high ridges out there that are made entirely of salt mixed with, with sediment, but you can eat the ground. You get down on your hands and knees and taste it. And you can taste the, the good, clean salt, and you can taste the, the salt that, that is full of heavy metals and arsenic, um, but you eat it anyway <laughs> because you have to. <laughs> How many places can you get down and actually taste the ground? And the salt is it's it's hard. It is not a it is not a, a soft substrate. So it's like walking on glass. Or at times that it sounds like you're watch, walking on crunchy armadillo skins for, for hours or for days. And and you're setting your camp out in these out in these salt ridges. I was looking at this place and imagining, okay, so this is the end of the world. This is, this is you know, the, the sun is, is, uh, is going, going to be a um, planetary nebula soon. The, the atmosphere is being stripped off. Um, this, this, is, this is it. This is, this is what it would look like. The oceans boiled away. Um, the mountains on the horizon might be the Hawaiian island chain sticking up, and you're down at the bottom walking around these, these pillars of salt. And when the sun rises, the salt expands, and so it makes noise. It pops. So it's actually it's kind of loud at times where, where all around you you're hearing these, these crackles and pops and zings of the, 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 the salt expanding, and you, you walk up to one of these pillars and, and put your ear against it, and you can hear inside of it just these... Zing, pop, crack, crack, ping. It, it's, it, it's, it's a bizarre place. You, you should walk across this sometime. It is, you, you have to carry all your water, um, so you're walking with probably a, a, an 80, 90-pound pack to, to start with, and, and every night it gets cold enough that your water freezes so that in the morning you're walking along and the ice is sloshing on your back and you're spending your day walking away from the sun, and then the sun sets, and the ice or the, the salt turns molten, and then the stars come out, and just brilliant sky down there, so absolutely clear. I mean, this, this exposure uh, couldn't have been more than, than 15 seconds. 
So this is what you are looking at. You are just with your back against the salt, looking up at the sky as your water freezes in your pack. And in the morning, the sun comes up and explodes across the landscape where you walk for days and you don't see a living thing. You don't see a blade of grass. You don't see a fly. You don't see an ant. It looks like the surface of Mars. This is a a picture of Mars here, and that's where we were. So... (laughs) That's it. You're on another planet right now. You're on a, a dead planet. But then you, you find something out there. You find this, this dead bush, which is, you know, pretty much life. <laughs> you know, maybe there are a bunch of these on Mars. I, we should look around and see if there are any, any of these bushes hanging out because this is another one where I spent a lot of time just on my knees in front of this thing going, it was here, there was life, other things like us out in the Atacama Desert, things that somehow lived here. There's no shade. Uh, well, the, there, there is shade, but it's down in these holes, these sinkholes. You look down into them. This is the picture JT took right then, looking down into the sinkhole. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically razor blades of, of salt. And so, but you want shade. <laughs> so you got you to gotta kind of wedge yourself in and... and climb down and, and get into the bottom of one of these things, and it's, it's nice and cool down there, but it's hard. And I don't like the idea of falling, you know, falling, ripping yourself apart on salt just, just sounds awful. But you're, this is where you take your shelter, down in the bottom of these holes looking up at the, the, the circle of the sky like you're down inside of, of, of some kind of well drilled down into the salt. I love this stuff. I live for this, to go out and wander across it, walking across these Salars. Um, I had kind of uh, hoped that this was going to be like the, the Salar de Uni in Bolivia, which is this, this enormous uh, salt flat that is actually flat. You could, wall, you could roll a, a cue ball across it. And I, and I said, oh, great, we're going to go to one of those Salars, and it's going to be flat, and we're going to walk across it, and it's going to be bizarre. And it turned out to be like walking across a coral reef. With, it, took, it took hours to make, make half a mile. And, and when you're looking for a place to sleep out here, you're walking in the dark with your headlamp for hours and hours hours looking for any place soft because you cannot sit down in this stuff. It just tears the, the ass out of your pants. It's, this, it's an awful place. But you get out into the middle of it where, this, the, where the, the snow melt has gone down underneath the salar and, and the, the salt formations are growing up out of it. And it is like coming across life, but it's, it's life in the form of just salt. Um, these, these beautiful shapes, almost like marine organisms. And, the, and we found water there. We found um, these, these holes and, and you'd taste it and it, you'd have to spit it out right away because it's, it's saltier than seawater. Um, but, but to find water in this, this dry, dry place, it doesn't matter if you can't drink it. You just hang out there. Again, for, this is what I do. You know, I, I wander around in complete desolation looking for some little thing that I can sit there and go, oh, my God, look at it. It's real. It's something to focus your attention on. I mean, you find a dead cow out there, and it is a party. It is a, just incredible and you look down into these water holes and the, and the salt crystals are growing inside of them. We, we actually, we found one that was, that was flowing out. It was coming out of the hole and, and flowing across the salar. So, so there was this river with, uh, with, uh, with, with salt grasses growing in places along the margins. And, and uh, I remember the first morning we came across this, this river um, the, we, the ice was in our packs, and the, the, the sun was, was, was coming on, so it was rapidly getting hotter. And every morning, these mirages would start spreading, these, these beautiful silver mirages that are reflecting the mountains in the distance. So it looks like you're in the middle of this silver lake. And then it gets really strange because pink flamingos come flying in over your head. And the flamingos are coming and, and, uh, and straining brine shrimp out of, out of these water sources. But that's where you're, where you're just, you're at the end of the world and, and there are flamingos. And, and you're just looking at it saying, yes, this is what the planet is about. 
I mean, take it all the way out and there will still be something somehow. I, while writing this book, I, I, um, I spent time interviewing um, the, uh, the biologist E.O. Wilson and, and uh, would, would go to his study in, in Harvard and we would just, we would sit and talk about extinction and, and he was saying, I asked him, how far can, how far is too far? How, can, how far can you take it before it's just over on this planet? And he just, he smiled and he said, I think you know the answer to that question. You know, you can take it all the way. You can, you can kill off everything and still there would be microbes here. So life wouldn't end, but do you really want to take it that far? Do you really want to see the world end like that? And out in the Atacama, there have been uh, a core, cores taken out of, the, out of the salt, and microbes have been found suspended in, in halite inside of the cores that, that have been revived after 40,000 years. And, and so I, I, you, know, you, you realize that, that life is, is very resilient on this planet. It, it lives inside of the, the, the salt. But that's not life. That's not the Holocene. That's not this moment. I'm interested in seeing what the end looks like. But I want to come back. I want to come back to the world. I want to leave this place and come back to where the trees are growing, to where you can drink clean water. I'm interested in these places where things change. I'm interested in where, where, you know, where the, the crust of the planet breaks. I, I've, I've been thinking about asteroids. You know, crust being broken from above or volcanoes, the crust being broken from below. I, I've always wanted to get out around live lava, so I, I, uh, I traveled out on, uh, actually with JT, the same person I was with in the Atacama, we, we walked out into, uh, into the, uh, on, on the big island of Hawaii, into the East Rift Zone. Where, where there had been uh, subdivisions and, and, and pieces of jungle several weeks before, and the flow had completely covered them over. And, and uh, we, we spent time with, with a guy living in the last house at the edge of the lava flow, and he was so excited about this. And his house has since burned down, and he, w- he just couldn't wait for it to happen. He was this, this lava junkie who, you know, you'd be sitting in a, drinking tea with him and looking out the kitchen window, and you're just looking at total devastation out there, just, just this black, steaming masses of rock, and, and you're drinking tea going, oh, my God, we, we are at the edge. And, and he... he, he told me what to watch out for, the places to walk, the places not to walk. And, and he showed me over, over a period of weeks as, as I came and visited with him how the lava around him was, was rising and falling. The, the, the hardened lava was, you could see where, where, it was, where the, the actual liquid lava underneath was pushing up. And he's just going, any day, one of those is going to blow, it's going to break, and it's going to start coming out. And so we waited until you could see a little bit of glow at night. And then uh, my friend and I put on our packs and headed out into this, walking through this, this just beautiful landscape of, of, of devastation, of, of what had been houses and, and uh, big ohia trees, and now was this blackness that, that uh, you know, you could, you could call it the end, but it looks like the beginning. It looks like the first forms on the earth. It looks like the first orchid, the first fiddle neck, the, the first violin being formed right here. The shapes that are eventually the earth are being made right in front of you. We'd set our camp out in these places where, where you know, in some spots you, you can't sit down. It's like walking across a... a uh, the, the top of a, a wood stove, and you're just kind of, you're moving fast, and, and you spit on the ground, and it, it, it doesn't sizzle, but it dries up quickly. And, you know, we, we'd be tapping our, our sticks, going, hmm, how, this sounds kind of hollow. Like, when it, when it breaks through, what it's, what's it like to fall into a pit of lava? <laughs> what does it feel like to be tumbling down <laughs> into it? We'd come across these, these, uh, these these formations uh, uh, tumuli these these uh, these blisters 
and the, the air above them is just, is just blurred with the heat that's coming out. And you, you walk up and you, you feel this column of heat. You don't get too close, but close enough that you can feel this, this heat just shooting straight out of the ground. And you look for it at night. You look for the glow and you head for it. And it is this, this amazing front of lava moving about that fast, at least where we were, and, and just picking up pieces of rock and, and, and you know, picking up what had been liquid the night before and carrying it along. You hear these, these scratches and these pops and hisses as glutinous masses of, 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 of lava come pouring out, turning black and then opening again and rivers picking up speed and closing down and damming and pouring all around you. And you're, you're having to, to keep track to make sure you're not closed off by any of it. You can't get too close. You can get five feet away and it, it strips the sweat off of your face. You can get three feet away and it feels like your eyeballs are going to pop. That's about as close as you want to get. But you've got to see it because it's coming out of the ground and flowing around you. This is what is under our feet all the time. This is what is pushing tectonics, pushing continental continents into each other, tectonic plates moving around each other. I, I, I carried around the, the video camera and just just took images of, uh, or took little clips of, of the lava as it's forming, these, these beautiful bellies like, like the sun coming out from inside of the, the planet. I, was, I, I carried a, a penny in my pocket as, as maybe an offering that, that I was going to go up and, and throw it into the lava and watch it melt. I, I had this vision, like, like uh, when in Lord of the Rings, when Gollum fell into the lava, and the ring melted, that's what was going to happen. I was going to throw it in, and I imagined the lava was going to be like pudding, and it was just going to sink into it and melt. And, and I had this whole idea in my head of just saying, okay, this represents my civilization. This is, this is human history right here, and I'm going to throw it in and just watch this, the, the enormity of the planet swallow it. So I lifted it back, I threw it in, and it went ping, and it bounced right off. And at that moment, I realized where we are. This isn't pudding coming out of the earth. This is molten steel. We are on this molten ball where it's pushing up underneath our feet all the time, pressing against the surface of the planet. It's easy to imagine the surface of the planet is what is here, is, is that it's, it's, the, it's the oceans, it's, it's the crust, it's, the, it's where we farm, where we live, but it is so thin. And you go to these places where you can feel it underneath you. The reason I was traveling there, I, I wanted to see succession. I wanted to see what happens when, when, uh, when a subdivision and, and, a, and a forest get, get just taken back to zero and, and how long it takes for life to come back into these places. And there, there are these, um, these features that are known as kapukas. Uh, uh, a kapuka is a place where the lava flows around something. And so you have uh, lava to the horizon all around you, and then you have this little forest in the middle where it just happened to go around this one spot. Here's a, a, a kapuka from, uh, from a couple decades ago where this was a subdivision, and um, it's completely surrounded by lava. No, uh, there is one house out there, I believe, where somebody still lives. These kapukas reseed the lava. This is where life comes from that goes back into the lava. The, the crickets and the spiders come out of these forests. The seeds blow out into the lava. The, the, the ferns uh, send their rhizomes down and start breaking apart the, the glassy rock and turning it into soil. This is lava that's about, um, I believe this is, this is four years old. So these kapukas seed the future. And, and in an apocalyptic planet, I'm using kapukas as, as the model, as, as this, is, this is what you want to have on this planet. You need a lot of kapukas. You need all kinds of ecosystems uh, that have just strong ecological capacity. You, you, want, you want to hold on to, uh, to uh, pieces of, of Great Lakes ecosystems, uh, uh, um, coastal ecosystems, uh, sand dunes, prairie grass, alpine areas, as many kapukas as you can get, as many refuges, because when the lava comes, that's what makes a healthy planet. 
That what, that's what makes this planet resilient. You have a lot of ecosystems that are ready to go. If you, if you look back into the Earth's history where um, you know, there have been plenty of times that, that there have been large bolide impacts, um, asteroids have hit the planet, and you do not see much of a reaction in the fossil record as, as compared to the, the dinosaur extinction 65 million years ago where you, where you see an impact and you see a, a reaction in the, the, the record. I think what's going on is, is asteroids are hitting at times when the Earth is really healthy and it doesn't devastate the planet. Whereas if you look at the dinosaur extinction, prior to the, the, uh, the Chicxulub impact, health was going down, fossils are disappearing, the planet is not so healthy, so it's primed for a mass extinction. When the asteroid hits at a point where the planet is not healthy, where there aren't many kapukas, the thing crashes. And so I'm looking at the planet now going, okay, this is one of those moments where you don't want an asteroid to hit. This is one of those moments where the planet doesn't seem to be particularly healthy, where species extinction is, is ramping up, where we're losing... Uh, it's, this is not when you want to have it happen. But it's not just asteroids hitting, it's us. We are one of the asteroids hitting the planet. We are something that is coming on fast and changing landscapes on a huge scale around the planet, changing chemical balances in the atmosphere, in the ocean. So we are one of those things that is, that is altering this planet. This is the moment you don't want something else to happen. And we're living as if, as if nothing else will happen, as if we are the only variable here. So I went out looking to see what happens after the devastation. I went out to see the ohia plants and the ferns growing back into the lava, to see the, the pioneer species coming out, you know, the people coming out. The people, you know, they're humans are another one of the species setting up shop, building on top of the lava, putting out the lawn chairs. We are growing out there on this solid rock. This is, this is a, a forest that is, that is about 50 years old that has grown onto the lava. Then you go into a tree fern forest on lava that is 400 years old, and life has moved back in. Life has swallowed this place. The, the, this is a native tree fern forest um, just a bizarre place because there are no trails in there. There uh, to travel through, you're just climbing through windows in the vegetation. The, the landscape looks as if you could turn it upside down and it would, you couldn't tell the difference. It is just life coming out of the ground and, and the canopy looks like the, the ground above you. You're just within this plant kingdom. Originally in, in, uh, in, in Hawaii, at least uh, pre-human contact with Hawaii, there were only two native mammals, um, a bat and a seal. And so there weren't any land animals. The largest herbivore in Hawaii was a duck. So you didn't have animals moving through these forests. So this forest looks like what Hawaii looked like before people were there. I, I've been in jungles in different parts of the world, and there are always animal trails. And this was the bizarrest place because there were no, there were no trails. There, this was a plant kingdom. And I, I'm looking at this thinking, okay, so this is after some devastation. Something terrible has happened on Earth. And this is what comes back. What's missing here? Mammals. We're gone. In fact, there are very few insects in this forest. The only time you really find um, mosquitoes out there are when feral pigs root up these, these, um, these tree ferns and cause them to fall over, leaving these holes where water collects and you get mosquitoes. So most of what's going on out here are, are plants. And you know, there are birds, but um, the, the native, native species of birds have they're almost entirely gone from Hawaii. But this was my hope. This is where I was looking at it saying, you know, it's not about us coming back. It's about the world living on, that you can't destroy this planet. But do you want to wait 10 million years for life to come back, which that's about how long it takes for biodiversity to return after a, uh, after a, a mass extinction event. So, I, you know, sometimes I take the geologic view and I step back and I say, you know what, it's going to be fine. The world is a beautiful place, it's resilient. Yes, it may be destroyed by us or some other event, but it will come back. The earth has seen worse than it is seeing right now, but then we haven't seen worse. The species around us haven't seen worse. And when I think about this, you know, I think about the end. I think about different ways that, that things could come apart. And, and after writing Apocalyptic Planet, 
the worst ending that I could imagine, I finally found here in Iowa. This is a uh, GMO cornfield in central Iowa where um, um, I, I hooked up with a friend of mine. I don't know why he came with me on this trip. This was the most miserable thing I've ever done in my life. We, we went to central Iowa in July, the height of summer. We put on packs and we backpacked across GMO fields for three days. Um, and, and what I was looking for was, was a landscape that, that resembled a mass extinction. And I looked around the world at different environments, at the, the, uh, the Aral Sea, at Chad, at Lake Chad, you know, places that are just devastated. And finally I realized, oh, it's Iowa. That's what a mass extinction looks like, where, where everything that used to be there is gone and replaced by just a handful of species. And you put on your pack and you head into the corn, and as soon as you walk through those first layers, you disappear. The place just swallows you. You've got to cover yourself when you're walking in there. Uh, the, the, the leaves are, are fairly stiff, and they, they especially hit you right on the bridge of your nose, because you're, just, you're pushing through a wall of leaves, and then you start bleeding down your nose, which I don't think in a place that's just primarily anhydrous ammonia and pesticide and herbicides that you really want uh, to be having many open wounds. So you, you cover your, your face with a bandana, and you tuck it up underneath your sunglasses so that, that you won't start bleeding at the bridge of your nose. And this is what it looks like all the time. You are just pushing through corn leaves, and you can't see out of it. The, the, the canopy of the corn is about eight feet tall, so you, you get the, a sprinkling of the sky. And when we were out there, uh, it was a meteorological anomaly called a heat dome, where 900 new high records were set across the continent, and the nearest record high to us on the, on the dew point was 129 degrees Fahrenheit. So basically, you're, you're in this place where it feels like you just climbed out of a hot tub fully dressed. You were just drenched and dripping on yourself. And like I said, this is, this is it. This is, the, this is your experience. Hours and hours of moving through this, hemmed in on either side by, by cornrows just wide enough that your pack can fit through, but you can't quite turn around and look behind you. I, as I went into this, I originally I thought, you know, maybe this is a new sport that I'm inventing, that, that corn backpacking is going to be great. Like, it'll be great for the blind because you can't, Over you're, here. you're going straight. Uh-oh, I'm running out of power. That happens. <laughs> That's how it ends, you know. <laughs> work. Give me a second here. You just have to plug it in over and over again until it finally comes on. There we go. I think. There. Ah, enough of that. God, that was horrible. I, it, just, it, it, was, it was a really awful experience in many ways. Angus, I, he, he, we're friends again. Uh, <laughs> But my, my, my purpose out there was to see if anything else was alive in the cornfields. And, and I come back to tell you that not much is alive in the cornfields. You know, there, there are some tiny little mushrooms growing in there. And, and, and there are things, uh, there are uh, uh, deer that, that come through. Uh, we, we did run into one late one night. But... Um, it's, it's hard to even find an insect out there. Everything is miniaturized. They're, they're the smallest of spiders, the smallest of ants, and not very many of them. You can crawl on your hands and knees for, for 20 minutes before you finally find some other living thing in there. But, you know, sometimes you will see a grasshopper, but the grasshoppers, most insects stay to the outside of the, the cornfield, the edges, because the, the, uh, there's a gene that's in the corn that is a pesticide. So the, the corn is actually a, a poison to the insects. So, so there's this, this race between the grasshoppers and the genetic engineers to, uh, because the grasshoppers are, are adapting. They're, they're getting deeper into the corn and the genetic engineers are pushing them back. And I'm, I'm thinking that this is, um, this is a uh, high-speed evolution going on right here. And the future of the planet is going to be corn and grasshoppers and everything that radiates out from them. 
And this, is, uh, this isn't a tall grass prairie, but this is what, what's out there. Um, you know, this, is, this, is, this actually used to be a cornfield. This is two years after a cornfield. And it has been replanted and burned and planted and burned. And, and they're trying to get native grasses to grow back in here. And so it was heartening for me to go check out a place like this where, where you could say, okay, two years ago, this was, this was just, this was monoculture. This, this was, you know, death. This was mass extinction. And, and life is coming back to this place. But think that right now, uh, the... Iowa, 90% of the land, the surface area of Iowa is under agricultural production. 90% of a landscape turned to corn and soybeans. And, and the, the, the farmers out there, the, the, the farmer that, that I spent time with uh, who, who uh, owns this field, they're just, they're, they're such hospitable, wonderful people. And, and I talked to him about this dilemma. I said, you know what, this is, is this right? <laughs> is it supposed to be this way? And he said, you know, we've we got 7 billion people on the planet, and my job is to keep food moving, that, that this is what I do. I'm part of this thing. This is my job. And, and, and I understood what he was saying, that you can't have an agricultural collapse when you're relying on this kind of production, that, this, that he is keeping people alive. You know, and, and, and where does that go? 7 billion to 10 billion to 15 billion to 30 billion? You know, where does where does that end? The reason I say that this is the most terrifying future I can imagine is because this is humans covering everything. This is what I don't want to see. I don't want to see us everywhere. Angus didn't want to see us everywhere either. He was, I think, you know, just a few hours into this, he was, he was sick of the, the whole trip. And you'd, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd drop into the bottom of the corn rows and just, just lie there breathing, just gasping. And, and, and you're, if you're not moving up high, you're dropped into the row, and this is your view. You, you finally have a little bit of a, a view, right? You know, if you're down like at ankle high, you can kind of see around. And above you is just this, this ceiling of, of corn leaves, and Angus is just hating it. I'm fucking tired of being hot and sticky and dirty. Can you say fucking in this book? <laughs> and you have to, right? You have to eat the corn. Um, and and I, was, I was talking to some, uh, uh, some researchers working in, in, uh, on, on looking at gene transfer, horizontal gene transfer, where, where genes can actually pass through a genetically modified organism into another species. And, and they were saying, oh, th this is extremely rare. It, it, you know, you don't have to worry about it. You know, as long as you weren't, like, eating corn right there at the source, and as long as you weren't just covered in, in it, and I'm just going, oh, my God. <laughs> because we felt like grimy amphibians out there. We were just, it was, it was, it was stuck to us because the soil is, is like this shoe polish. It's, it's not even soil anymore. And, and this is what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that we just keep going, that we don't stop, that we, we plant everything and there's nothing left. We, we consume the entire planet because I, I, many of the scientists that I spoke to said just, just out of hand, they said, oh, yeah, humans, we're not going to last. You know, we're, we're short for this world. We're, we're, we're gone. We're practically gone at this point. And I would say, well, where's your evidence for that? And they would say, well, I, it's obvious. And, and, it, and I realized this is just a gut feeling that humans aren't going to last. And I look at the species and think, wow, this is one of the more adaptable species on this planet. You know, maybe not as individuals, but as a species. Yes, our civilizations come and go, languages, societies, they, they, they rise and fall, but this species, I think, is going to outlive many others. I think we will kill off everything in order to survive. That's why I'm afraid of this future, why I'm afraid of the corn, because I don't want to kill everything so that we can live. I want there to be kapukas. I want there to be seeds ready to go all over the planet, ecosystems that are ready, ecosystems that are thriving. I don't want to consume everything. I want there to be something out there that doesn't smell like us. We set our, uh, we set our camp on these, uh, on these places kind of balded by excess herbicides where you could, you could actually find some ground. This is a... Uh, 
This is a drainage. They don't irrigate here. There's already water in the soil. They're actually trying to get water out of the soil. So there was this drainage right through the middle that let the water out. And that's where the grasshoppers could live. And it, you walk into it, and there are thousands of grasshoppers rising in front of you. And, um, and I, was, I was wearing a silk shirt, which I wear when I travel in the desert. And I thought I was being Mr. Summer traveler, I'm wise, I'm wearing a silk shirt. It was an awful thing to be wearing. It was, it was like wearing a wet tongue because it was just always wet and stuck to you. And then, then one day I found that the grasshoppers were eating my silk shirt. <laughs> and so they're eating holes in my shirt, but it's so damn hot that you don't care. You're just stumbling ahead and looking down and there are grasshoppers on you and they're eating and you're just going, I don't care, I just want this to end. Oh. And at night, you just beg for a breeze, for anything to move, because it is so still, and you're just sitting naked in your tent, just trying not to touch the walls of the tent, because if you did, the whole tent would just stick to your face. <laughs> and the last morning, things changed. Uh, the last morning, a, a rainstorm came in, and I thought, oh, this will be marvelous. It's going to rain. And it was awful, too, because it was just hot water falling out of the sky. And you're just standing there, and the corn just soaked with hot water. And I was waiting for Angus to come by, because I knew that I'd catch, catch something witty on camera. He would stop. We would have some conversation. I would get a little clip. So I just stood there waiting for him. Angus, who just utterly hates me at this point, <laughs> who wants nothing but to get out. <laughs> but you'll, you'll notice here, there are some trees on the horizon, and, and we found something that we had not expected. On, on one of the sides of the, the cornfield was this 40-acre wildlife refuge that I, I had... I, it was, it was a miracle to see it, to, to go into this place where, where things are actually alive. Um, it's, not, it's something that's not corn. I mean, there are soybeans out there. I didn't mention that. Um, and, and so it's not just a monoculture. There are two species. Um, but here you get into this, this forest, and, and there are mushrooms. There are, there are birds. There are, I mean, in the, in the corn, we'd wait hours and hours, and you'd see some shadow go by, and you go, oh, bird. And that would be a big moment. And here, the, the trees were full of birds. And, and I did, you know, I, I mentioned this place to, to E.O. E. Wilson, and he said, was it a real forest? Or was it just all non-natives that were brought in there? And, and yes, he's right. It, it is not a, a true, um, it, it's a, definitely its own ecosystem, but everything was, was brought in. Everything, in fact, when you start looking around, you realize this was a completely manufactured wildlife refuge where a dead tree snag looked like it was about to fall. There were a bunch of trees around it that had been girdled by a chainsaw so that when that tree falls, there'll be a bunch of other dead snags there ready to replace that tree, that single tree habitat. So this, this is totally managed. But it's, it's still wild, and, and when we, as we looked around, we, we found that, oh, this is an old arboretum. This is an old tree museum. There, there were these, these signs and, and benches. You know, people don't come back in here anymore, but it was a, it was a place where, where people would come and sit and look at trees, and you see this, this black cherry sign just being overwhelmed by lichens, and for me, this was hope. This is just me saying, yes, yes, life comes back. It, it springs back out. You can't stop it. Angus, Angus was still not impressed. expected this trip. I had nothing witty for you. No, stop recording me. I guess I'm sitting here taking it, aren't I? This isn't going to be, you're not going to use this at all, it's not going to be useful, it's not going to be a witty moment in your show. Uh. 
So walking through this forest, we found a, a crick. They call them cricks there. And the, f- uh, the farmer had told me, don't go swimming in the crick. They're not safe places. And, and when I went down and looked at the crick, I, I lifted up rocks and I realized why they're not safe. There's nothing living in there. They're, you know, you usually pull up a rock and, and it's covered with, with little invertebrates crawling all over it. And there was just nothing at all. But still, it was water flowing through oak trees. It was water flowing through brush. And we, we found a bridge and we walked across it. And just stood there for a while, listening to the rain falling out of the trees and landing in the water. And yeah, I'm afraid for the future. I'm afraid for what will happen. I I worry about us just continuing on and on, that we will cover this planet, that we will change everything, that we will geoengineer and and turn everything into agriculture and pave it over until this is a, a concrete ball. And I know that there are other futures. I know that the ice will return. I know that glaciers will flow again, that you'll go up to Yosemite someday, maybe 10,000 years from now, maybe 50,000, maybe 10 million years, and there will be ice pouring out of those mountains. Nothing stays the same on this planet. Everything changes. There is no singular trajectory. We are not heading toward a devastated ball floating in space. This planet is alive. This planet is changing all the time, and I travel out there looking for these places. I look for where things end because I want to see how they begin. I don't want to just see devastation out there. I want to see life crawling across this globe. I want to see ice coming and going. I want to see these seasons moving in and out of each other, and I want to be out in the middle of it as it's happening, which is why I'm here, which is why I was in Yosemite, why I put my back against that rock and felt the glaciers pouring around me because we live on this planet. You walk out that door and it will be out there. You will smell it. You will see it up in the sky. We live in this place. Go out there. Breathe it in. Thank you for coming and listening tonight. Thank you. You know what got me on that last bit on the bridge was the sound of Midwestern thunder. Yeah. (laughs) Which we don't have here. I grew up in northern Illinois in those cornfields. And those thunderstorms were sort of the the planetary thing that happened to us. Uh, You'd see the wall of rain come up the street and just feel, oh, yeah, this is summer. All right, we got some questions here. Um, Hannah asks, what is the most stable, unchanging place on Earth now? I don't know, it might be the Atacama Desert. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, what did you say, millions of years, really? Uh, I think 150 million years is, is how long. But it, it does, that place fluctuates too because uh, those, those solars are formed by uh, wetter periods mm-hmm. where, where snow melt is, is, is coming down into the, into the basins and then drying and leaving the salt formations. Why is it so stable? The Andes pretty fixed or what? Yeah, it's, uh, the, there's a dry current coming in off of Antarctica. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's a current that has been there for a very long time. It's, it's always right. pushing up against the, the, the edge, of, edge of, well, not, it hasn't always been South America, but then you, also, you have uh, mountain ranges that, that have been continuously building and causing a rain shadow. So those two things are keeping that place really dry. I'm, I'm sure there are other, there are biotically sta- stable places. Um, Shah, looks like Shan. Hmm? What is a place you would like to experience but can't go to? Uh, space? You know, I've really Very been interested reduced in, in Mars. space, I understand. <laughs> I want to go backpacking on Mars. Backpacking on Mars. <laughs> but I, I, you can't go barefoot, um, which, <laughs> which is going to keep me from going there. Because I didn't I really... see you going barefoot in the Atacama. <laughs> well, every once in a while, you take yeah. your, your really? shoes off. <laughs> I, uh, Mars is... I, because of the scale of that mm-hmm. place, because it, uh, the, it doesn't have the plate tectonics that the Earth has, so mm-hmm. when there's a volcano, it just keeps coming up in the same spot, so you oh, end up with enormous landscapes. Uh, so, so even though it's a smaller planet, it has bigger features than a little the Earth less has. gravity, so you can yeah, and then you can jump a longer around, day, um, but you can't go barefoot. So much heavier pack. Hey, right, you got your water; it's lighter. 
You must have a, a list of places you're still dying to go to. Um, what's on it? Oh, everywhere. <laughs> um, you know, actually, where I, this this probably isn't the answer that that person wants, but I, I or that you want. I I want to go back home. <laughs> I want to I, I want to go to the southwest, to the canyons of the the Colorado Plateau and the Sonoran Desert, the places where I. I, I, I'm kind of a home person. I really I like to go back to the same canyon mm -hmm. season after season, so I really know all the boulders. So you know, traveling the world has been a fascinating experience, but I'm really I'm focused on on being in uh, in you know canyon. So part of what it, it looks like you do in these exotic places is if there are people there, you try to connect with the ones who live there, who do who for whom it is home. Right. And so you get a contrast between you as a newbie experiencing the, the instant weirdness of it all and these people who are really engaged in it the way you are in the Southwest. How does, how does those play against each other? Well, I'm, I'm a stranger in those mm -hmm. places. So right. it's, it's, I'm, I'm out of my element. For one of the chapters in that book, I, I was on a, an island in the Bering Sea. It was a Yupik Eskimo island, so there were, mm -hmm. there were two villages. I was at one of the villages, and, and they had such an understanding of their place. They'd been there for 2,000 years, and, and, and I had no idea where I was or how to get around, and I said, you know, I just want to walk out there, and they're saying, well, polar bears, wolves, no, you can't just walk out there, and hunting territories are all over the place, and you're just going to walk right across them and not even know that they're there. So it's, it's hard for me to drop into a place where I don't know what the what the dynamics are, and but then I slowly learn from you know the, the Yupiks after after nine days they finally say okay now you can walk mm -hmm. now you can leave the village and and head out and explore. So you're how old? Forty six. How long have you been in the part of the Southwest where you are now? All, all my life, like Arizona, Colorado, back and forth between the two. What's the rate of, since you keep going out there and keep going to some of the same places, or do you keep discovering new things, or is the comfort that you don't discover new things, that it's all familiar now? No, I, I discover new things. I, I, I've gone down the, the Green River through Canyonlands, down to the confluence of the Colorado, which is a 100-mile stretch of river, probably 35 times now. Mm -hmm. And every time at the beginning of the trip, I'm just going... Yeah, you know, this this stuff is gonna happen. You're gonna find canyons you've never seen. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna come across rock art. There, there's always something. Now that seems like a kind of a, when I visit it, it seems like a really stable landscape. Uh, but it, you go the, along these the same river 35 times. Is it different each time? Oh yeah, the, the flash floods are blowing debris out into the river, and so mm -hmm. the river is changing uh, every every season and and. Canyon floors are changing where you get in there and it had been boulders last year and now it's just sand. Mm -hmm. And right now, this is the season, the big flash floods are running out there. So things are changing. But you wouldn't see it unless you saw it year by year because it looks stable. In, in your book, House of Rain, you were sort of exploring what drove the, the ancient peoples of the Southwest hither and yon with climate and conflict and so on. If it was just them living there now, in the current sort of climate situation in the Southwest, what would they be doing? Would they be on the move north or to higher They'd be heading land? south, probably. South um, into Mexico. Yeah, south out of the Colorado Plateau into central Arizona and Mexico, um, and probably into the Rio Grande area. This would, this would be one of the times where they'd, they'd start consolidating. They'd head toward and, water, basically. Right, so. right. Uh, it's is that happening amongst the current civilization? Well, we're bringing water to us. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do it differently. <laughs> Until you run out of water, and then right. it's the very place where I want to go. Mm -hmm. In ah. Mexico, there's a cave that has has enormous crystals in it. It's a hot cave, so ah. you can only stay in it for a short period of time. I want to go in and see those crystals. Is that doable? It's doable. People have gone in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I've I've had some contacts, but then lost the. You know, there, there's only so much one can do. Well, hang in. Um, you're working on a book now. Tell us about the book. I'm I'm writing about the first people to enter North America during the Ice Age. So it's a book that starts 28,000 years ago and ends 5,000 years ago. So I'm 
I've been traveling up in the Bering Land Bridge area, mm-hmm. and and my reason for for skiing across the Harding Ice Field was to to get an idea of what it would be like to have to cross ice. Mm-hmm. Uh, granted, from a 21st century perspective, but that's kind of what this book is about: is saying, mm-hmm. well, here we are with 21st century gear, trying to understand a, a Pleistocene world. But I'm I'm trying to bring North America back up and say, this is what it was like during the Pleistocene. This is this is where the mammoths were. This is the range of dire wolves of of the horses and camels. Here's what people were eating. Here's how they were hunting. Here's where the populations were starting to grow. Here are the the, the first kind of shadows and rumors of people, mm-hmm. you know, where where people may have been 40, 50,000 years ago, but it's not certain. But here's where they were 23,000 years ago. Here's where they were 28,000 years ago. So are your, there's a number of theories of when people came and where they came. And what you did in the Southwest is by walking the land, get your own sense of what, which theories were right and wrong about what happened there. Are you getting a sense of which theories are right and wrong from well, about when, when and how people got here? Yeah, and I think in, in House of Rain, I, I learned that in a way, all the theories are right. They're all mm-hmm. fighting against each other, but when you put them all together, you go, oh, all this was happening at once, and that's what mm-hmm. I'm seeing so far, where, where it's not just that people came across the land bridge or people came from the Iberian Peninsula and then died out on the East Coast or the people came down the, the, the Pacific Rim. People were coming from everywhere. The, there were multiple points of entry, um, depending on, you know, the, the ice was was leaving the, uh, the inside passage of British Columbia 17,000 years ago. And so there, mm-hmm. was a, there was a coastal passage that was open. And mm-hmm. then the inside, the, the uh, ice-free corridor opened up in, uh, in Alberta mm-hmm. 13,000 years ago. So you, you can see these different times uh, that people are moving in. And, and so are you recreating all, uh, revisiting all of the routes? Yeah, I'm trying to travel. Oh. On, um, all the w- different ways that people would have come in and crossed the continent. So one theory relatively recent is that they came along the west coast uh, by water, I guess yeah. along the beach and by boat and so on, and therefore were able to go quite a long way uh, fairly early on. Is that yeah. your sense of things? Yeah, because you're finding um, these, these, uh, these middens, bone middens, where, where people are eating fish that are deep sea fish. Aha. Uh-huh. So they're going out to get them, and you know, they're out on the... Canoes or kayaks or what, do we guess? There's nothing. I, I'm, I was looking at umiaks, the, the, big, mm. the walrus skin boats that mm-hmm. they're using up in, or that they, no, they still use them uh, in the Bering Sea of Western Alaska, and, and they're, they're fairly easy to build, and they're, they're sturdy. But it, it's not like people are just racing. Mm-hmm. It, this is taking thousands of years of, of just moving down, living, moving out farther, living, moving out farther. So it's generation by generation. Well, I wonder about that, because um, one of the things I got from House Rain is that people move farther faster than many of the anthropologists and archaeologists yeah. thought. Yeah, and that since they hadn't walked the land, they hadn't got that you can just walk the land, keep going, go for a few weeks, and you're a long way from where you started. Yeah, and and then there's people like you who just want to light out for the horizon, and it seems like every society has. I mean, how could Polynesians yeah. have gone from island to island across the Pacific, heading to absolutely a horizon with nothing on it, uh, except a you know fond hope, right. and yet they would go those long distances. So wouldn't it be a combination of, you know, sort of this village gets too big and they screw it, we're out of here, and they make another right. village a little way south, but uh, they're following the trail of the characters like you who just said, screw it, I'm really out of here, I yeah, want to see what's out there. I definitely think there were, there were people who, were just, who just could not stay still. I mean, we're always there. Every species has individuals who just have to go, and most of them probably disappear, but some get somewhere, and set up shop. I mean, when, when I came across the ice field, my object there was to say, hey, here's a bunch of crusaders. We're just out to have an adventure. And then the next trip was, 
my family coming up and meeting, meeting me in, in Alaska, and we went out with kayaks on, onto Prince William Sound, and, and I could say, okay, this is probably more what it looked like. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, there were the people going across going, yes, we're, we're exploring, we're seeing what's next, but then comes the family, and, mm -hmm. and you're, you're not just out exploring, you're, you're figuring out how many snacks do you have available to you. <laughs> And that's, uh, it's a combination of the two, I, I'm sure, that, that drives human migration. Well, we got to every continent, including lately Antarctica. Yeah, uh, we're, now we're, we're going to try other continents in the solar system called planets. We, we are excited to move, which, and, which scares me. I, I, I know I'm the leading edge of that, and you know, my kind of person is, is the one who's going, yes, yes, there's got to be more. You know, I am the reason <laughs> that this has happened. <laughs> You know, that we've, people like me have just gone, let's keep going, let's build more cities and, and keep exploring. And, and so I often look at my, my drive and say, yeah, this is what's wrong with us. We, <laughs> we can't stop. And I, but I love, I, there, there is this desire to move, to see, what, you know, what is around the corner? What, what keeps going? I would say lighten up on yourself in that respect. <laughs> I think that your love of these reduced places of the wilderness is part of uh, what lets everybody uh, appreciate and honor them and be determined to help protect them. So you're going there and looking uh, brings with it the sense of care and protection. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for having me.